Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the first edition of the Perception and Action News, which I'll be doing as part of my vlog series. So what's this about? Well, what I want to do here is share with you interesting things that I find that are related to the topics I cover in the podcast. The topics like motor learning, skill acquisition, technologies like VR as they relate to sports training. So these things are going to be websites, products, conferences, books. I'll also be doing a segment I'm going to call Article Rapid Fire, where I'll do quick reviews of interesting recent articles I find that will accompany kind of the more in-depth reviews I do on the podcast. And if you're interested in these kind of topics, um, the articles that I'm picking from are all ones that I post on my Twitter page. So if you're, if you're interested in seeing more of these kind of articles, you might consider following me on Twitter at ShakyWeights, and I'll tell you more about that at the end. So I'll do these reviews, and then I'll end with telling you uh, kind of what's coming up on the podcast and what I'm going to be doing on the vlog, and then we'll get out of here. Okay, so let's get rolling. First item I want to talk to you about today is a new book focused on a topic I know a lot of people are interested in, talent identification and talent development. This book is edited by a team led by Joe Baker from York University, who I interviewed on the podcast back in episode 37A. Joe always does a fantastic job at organizing these books and, and bringing together great groups of authors. And if you have a look at the table of contents, which you can see online, it looks like a really great uh, issue, a book with a lot of uh, really great topics. So I encourage you to have a look at that. The second item I want to look at is a new podcast. And if you know, if you follow me and if you know from the podcast that I'm a big lover of podcasts in general, this is a new podcast from the website sporttechie.com, which does a great job covering the technology developments with, that are related to sport. And this podcast is hosted by a former radio person from ESPN. And basically, it's a run through of the current news about sports technology. And they also occasionally have a kind of a big name guest. Uh, on the, one of their more recent episodes, for example, they had Mark Cuban. So I encourage you to check it out. It's really well done and it's quite interesting. Item number three, an upcoming conference, a meeting of the Expertise and Skill Acquisition Network, which is a network that is uh, led and run by Nick Smeaton from the University of Brighton. If there's one professional thing that I miss the most since moving back from England, it's being able to attend this meeting. Um, this meeting, which will be held, the upcoming version will be May 24th and 25th at University of Coventry. This meeting does exactly what I try to do in the podcast. That is, bring together academics and researchers with practitioners and coaches. In the meetings in the past, they've usually had one day focused on each of these. Um, they had some really great speakers, really great topics, and the social events are quite fun as well. So if you're anywhere in the area and you can attend that, I would strongly encourage registering um, and going. The last news item I want to cover before we get to the articles is a look at Disney's attempt at doing sports VR training. So they have this very nice setup where they have a head-mounted head display that can be tracked, motion tracked, um, and they have a person trying to catch a ball. And their big innovation with this is in the display, they include... Uh, predictions of the trajectory of the ball, so they include a line that shows you where the ball is going to travel, and they also have graphics which show you the estimated location your hand needs to be to catch the ball. And they add these things in to try to aid in your ability to catch a ball, approaching ball. Well, in my opinion, this is, approach is completely misguided, right? It's an example of doing non-human centered design because what we know from research on catching, particularly the outfielder problem, is that people do not catch like this at all, right? People do not try to predict the trajectory or predict the future rival location of the ball and just move their hand there. What they do is use perspective control. They move and couple their movements to some perceptual variable. So at no time do they make these kind of predictions or these kind of judgments about trajectory. So not surprisingly, when Disney did this, when they put these graphics in, people essentially ignored them, right? And they did their own natural strategy, which is way more effective. 
when people were forced to use the the aids that show, predicted the location, they essentially moved like a robot. Okay, so this is a really nice setup. But again, when you design things, training things, any kind of product that a human being is going to be used, you need to take into account the perceptual abilities and limitations of humans, right? We're not good at making these long-term predictions about where things are, so we've adapted much more effective strategies. In this case, cupping our perception and action. So if we design any VR system to train and help people catch, it should emphasize the, the strategy that works really well for us rather than trying to replace it with something that doesn't. So nice try, but I hope we'll go a different direction in the future. Okay, now on to article rapid fire. As I said, what I'm going to do is pick out a handful of articles and kind of do my quick review of these. Obviously, these are my opinions. You might not agree with them. If you want to write me back and, and give some feedback, I'm more than happy to take it. Also, if you have articles that you would like me to have a look at, please contact me. I will give you information about that at the end. So first up, we have this article called Fandom Biases Retrospective Judgments, Not Perception by Huff and Colleagues. So if you follow the podcast, you'll know that one of the things I'm kind of interested in is how fans perceive the action on the field or the court and how that compares to how athletes perceive it and how umpires, referees, and judges do. You know, what are the differences between these? And in this study, they did quite an interesting thing. They looked at... Um, they had took fans that were watching the championship league uh, final in 2013, which happened to be a match between two German teams. So it was hotly contested. They were BVB and FCB. And what they did was before the match, they identified 30 really rabid fans from each team. And they had them watch the games on their own in, in, on a computer, which might have, must have been quite a feat, right? You get rabid fans not to watch the game with their friends and other fans. Uh, they must have had to pay them a bit, I'm guessing. But anyway, they watched the games, and they had to do various things while they were watching the game. Um, they tracked the eye movements of the, the fans. And then uh, 10 to 12 days later, they had them come back and do a variety of things. And in a nutshell, what they found was there seemed to be no evidence that being a fan of one team or the other changed the way you actually perceive the event. And the way that they showed this was there was basically no difference in eye movements between the two fandoms. There was no difference in the way they segmented the match into offensive versus defensive plays or you know turnovers and things like that. And when you gave them a cued recall test later on, so for example, you'd show them a run of play and then stop the video right before someone passed and asked who did they pass to, both fandoms did equally well. So there was no evidence of that. What there was evidence of was kind of distortions of general overall assessments of the games. So if you ask the fans which teams had more possession, they, the, each team gave the number that was higher for their own team. If you ask them which team had a higher passing accuracy, each fandom gave a number that was higher for their own team. And also the confidence about what their judgments were kind of increased. Okay. So the evidence here was that fandom kind of fan, being a fan of one team or another kind of creates this distortion in memory, not a change in actual low-level perception. I think this is an interesting study, but one thing that was missing for me, and I know this would be hard to do with one single game, was really focusing on in on kind of critical calls and critical events. For example, offside calls or penalty calls. Right, that's where you would expect if there's any difference in perception, you would expect them there. Right, certainly hanging out in bar with people watching games, I've seen that where the same play in baseball, one fandom says it's obviously safe, the other one says they were obviously out. Right, so looking at these really critical game changing plays specifically would seem to be more relevant and interesting. And I know that's harder to do, but I think that's where I would put my focus. The second article I want to talk about was published by Carter and St. Marie, and this was focused on the importance of giving athletes choice when you go into a training and practice session, right? Does allowing them to choose some aspect of the design of the practice make for better outcomes? And there are a couple of related questions to this. 
doesn't matter whether the choice is relevant or irrelevant. So an irrelevant choice might be letting them choose the jer color of the jerseys you're going to practice in that day. Whereas a relevant choice might be, you know, allowing them to choose when they receive extrinsic feedback from a coach. And if there is an effect of this kind of choice, is it purely motivational, just kind of making them feel better, giving them more autonomy? Or is there actually a direct effect at low level motor learning? Okay. And so this article I touched on briefly, we touched on briefly in our interview that I had with Diane St. Marie back in episode 48. But it's a really nicely designed study. So what they did was have people learn to make an arm movements that matched a certain waveform. And they compared three groups. Okay, so they had a task relevant choice group. And what this group was allowed to do was to choose the schedule of the feedback they got. So after the arm movement, when they got feedback, they were shown a trace of their actual movement plotted against the, the desired movement. And the, cho the choice group, the task relevant group, were allowed to choose on which trials, after they completed the trial, they could say, I want to see feedback for that one. They only could have so much feedback and they had to use a certain amount. The task irrelevant choice group got to choose what color arm wrap was it used to fix the equipment, the motion tracking equipment during the experiment. And there was also a group that didn't have any choice at all. And the key aspect of this design of this study was that all three groups received the same amount of feedback. Okay, The same number of trials, they've all received feedback. The only difference being the one group got to choose specifically on which trials they got to see it. So what did they find? Well, overall, the task relevant choice group did better. Okay, And digging deeper and asking with questionnaires about motivation and autonomy, they found that it wasn't a motivational effect. What it was was actually they were better at detecting their own errors. Uh, so it was a motor learning effect. So I think this has really important implications for practice design, right? Instead of allowing your athletes to choose something as kind of a token gesture, maybe you want to let them choose something because they know what they need, right? They, they know what they need and when they need it. And they might have better insight that into it than a coach. So I think this is a really interesting study, and I look forward to seeing more research on this. The last study I want to talk about was by Pellick and Passmore and was on a topic I talked about a lot in the podcast, the focus of attention, right? Um, what, how that affects performer. And they were interested in a question that I've been interested in for a long time and I, I studied back in a, a study I did with my graduate student, Brooke, Brooke Castaneda. And they're interested in kind of whether all internal foci of attention are the same, right? So for me, what I was interested in was was attending to your hands in a baseball swing the same as attending to your bat, the same as attending to your feet? And in, a, in kind of Wolf's classic definition, those are all the same. They're all the same examples of internal focus of attention. So they were interested in getting kind of more subtle and seeing whether they're all internal focus of attention are the same. So what they did was have people do a golf putting task and they divided the, the foci of attention into pro, what they called proximal and distal. So proximal focus of attention was focusing on your elbow and your grip on the putter. So obviously these things have direct effect on the actual outcome because they're, they're affecting the movement of the putter itself. Versus the distal focus was on keeping the weight evenly distributed on your legs. Okay, So obviously that's important for golf, but it's not directly affecting the putter movement. And obviously those are both internal focus of attention. You're both, in both of them, you're focusing on your own body. And they compared this to the classical external focus of attention. One really nice aspect of the study was it was very a multi-measure approach. So they did performance, obviously. They did EEG, EMG. They did kinematics. So they had a lot of data here. Overall, this study was kind of a very mixed bag for me. Um, it took me a while to work through the results because there seemed to be quite inconsistent. So for performance, uh, the distal was the worst while for proximal had more effect on kinematics and EMG. So I'm not sure what the, this takeaway message is. There's also a couple issues. Uh, you know, if you followed me on the podcast and you read my articles, I'm not really a big fan of manipulating focus of attention with instructions, especially when you're trying to do a rather subtle manipulation like this, focusing on the elbows one time versus the weight in the feet one time. 
I have my doubts whether people will consistently do that and keep it. And, you know, obviously, the if you get results, you get results. But, you know, I have my doubts about that. Um, the study didn't include any manipulation checks to make sure people focused where they were told. So that's a problem. And a, an issue with the study that is kind of worrying is they didn't replicate the basic effect that you find in, in most attention studies where people do better with external focus of attention than er internal. That was also kind of inconsistent. So I think this was a nice attempt, but I'm really not sure what to take, home, take away from it. There's kind of a mixed bag of results and some issues for me. Okay, so that's it for the, the news items. Now I want to tell you what's upcoming on the podcast and on my vlog. So coming next on the podcast will be an interview I had with John Kiley from UCLan. So John is a SNC physiology person that focuses on the stress process and how it has implications for periodization and training. And on the surface, that might not sound like a topic that I would have on the podcast because I tend to focus on psychology. But I think you'll see it's a really interesting uh, relationship uh, between this kind of physiology and psychology issues. And John has some really great insights that I think will have a lot of interesting implications for people thinking about how they design practice, how they cope with the athlete's anxiety, both on the field and from off the field issues. So I encourage you to check that out. Also coming on the podcast soon, I'll have an issue uh, episode specifically focused on the topic of topics of flow and psychological momentum. You know, you hear these terms thrown around, thrown around a lot, an athlete's in the flow. What exactly do they mean? Uh, can we manipulate it? How often do they occur? So what I'll focus on is kind of the summary of all, all what's been done so far on the topic, which is not very much because it's not been studied for very long, actually, and some very recent articles as well. And finally, on the vlog, I'm going to have an episode talking about perceptual motor adaptation where you can look at me play darts, watch me play darts and kind of mess around and look at how bad I am. So hopefully you have some fun with that. Finally, if you have any suggestions, feedbacks, comments about anything that I'm doing, the podcast, the vlogs, these news segments, please feel free to contact me, robgray at asu.edu for email or on Twitter at shakyweights. And again, all these kind of articles that I talk about will be ones that I post on there. So if you want to see the full stream of ones that I post, please, please check that out. And for any information related to anything that I do, you know, all the different things that I'm doing, trying to do now, you can find it all at perceptionaction.com. So this is Rob Gray from ASU and perceptionaction.com. Cheers for now.